What's up, y'all? Thanks for tuning in. Today, we're going to talk about what is the place of Jewish tradition in Messianic Judaism. Yes, yes, y'all. Thanks for tuning in. My name is Messianic Rabbi Eduardo, and today we're going to be talking about the place of Jewish tradition in the Messianic Judaism. See, we in the Messianic movement, we think that sometimes in order to appear more authentic, what we do is we want to appear more Jewish, or that we want to look at the rabbinic spectrum or the Jewish tradition in order to apply it to our lives to say, look, this is how we are more Messianic. This is how we are more true. This is how we represent uh, true Judaism, that 21st century Judaism is the Judaism of Yeshua, quote unquote, and this is what's being taught when the reality is that's not the case. See, I think we in the Messianic movement, we can stand on our own in applying the Jewish tradition to our lives. See, the real question is, should we as Messianic believers, as Messianic Jews, as Messianic non-Jews following Yeshua, the Jewish Messiah, what should rabbinic tradition, quote, Jewish tradition have to do with our lives and and how should it speak to our lives and what authority do the orthodox rabbis really have in speaking to the messianic movement see the real question is can the messianic movement stand on its own and so to do that we're going to look at a few verses today and we're going to look at some of the things that yeshua said so the first one we're going to look at is matthew 23 1 to 4 and this is a verse when yeshua is beginning to talk to his disciples about the authority of the pharisees so we're going to read it. Um, Yeshua spoke to the crowds and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees have seated themselves in the chair of Moses, Kiset Moshe. Therefore, all that they tell you to do, observe. But do not do according to their deeds, for they say things and do not do them. They tie up heavy burdens and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves aren't willing to move them with so much as a finger. So yeah, so Yeshua is given an authority to the Pharisaic expression, to the Pharisaic movement of his day. And he's saying, look, they are sitting in the seat of Moses, that they are in a chain of transmission and, and relaying the truths of God as far as he understood it, that indeed we should follow what they're saying. But is this where Yeshua leaves everything at? So is there a change in the transmission of the authority or does it really stay with the Pharisaic movement of that day? So in order to do that, we're going to look at some other verses. See, Yeshua, in, in giving the Pharisaic movement a place and a seat of honor, does that mean that the later rabbis are the ones who remain in authority for the modern Messianic Jewish movement? And I would say that that's not the case, because Yeshua, what Yeshua does is he transfers the authority from the wide Pharisaic movement to a smaller controlled group, which would be his disciples and his Talmudim, those who believe in him. So we're going to go to Matthew 18, 18, where Yeshua says, Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And this isn't the only time that he says this to his disciples. He also, in talking to Peter, he says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. So what does this mean? See, a lot of Christians want to teach that, oh, this is uh, demons, that Yeshua is giving his disciples the authority to, to bind demons and then to loosen demons, which is, which is absolutely absurd, right? There's no truth to that. But what if there's something deeper to this? What if Yeshua, in his Jewish context, is giving halachic authority to his disciples and to his Talmudim? So there's a Christian Hebraist, John Gill from the 18th century, and he wrote this in his commentary, and you can find it online in many different places, studylight.org. I'll, I'll list it all in the bottom of the website where you can look at this. John Gill, he says, when Yeshua is talking about the binding and the loosening of the authority that he gives his disciples, the keys to the kingdom, that this is not to be understood of binding or loosening men's sins. Because So this can be an interpretation that this is a, a, an allowance for the Gentiles to come in, but this isn't really what Yeshua is talking about uh, by laying on or talking of censures and excommunications, but instead it's only of doctrines, essentially beliefs, perspectives, or declarations of what is lawful and unlawful, free or prohibited to be received or practiced 
in which sense the words bound and loosed are used in the Talmudic writing times, without number, for that which is forbidden and declared to be unlawful, and for that which is free of use and pronounced to be so. In multitudes of places we read of one rabbi, binding and of another loosening. Thousands and ten thousands of instances of this kind might be produced. So what we're finding is that John Gill is explaining that Yeshua is actually giving halakhic authority, meaning hal halakha, coming from the way that we walk, that Yeshua is giving authority to his disciples, the authority that he has, to make halakhic rulings, to bind and loosen life and, and, and experience in their communities, and that this is not outside of the understanding of what eventually becomes rabbinic Talmudic Judaism, where they are binding and loosening things for their community. So John Gill is not the only guy we're going to look at. We're going to look at John Lightfoot, who's another gentleman about 100 years earlier than John Gill. He says, but now to bind and loose, a very usual phrase in the Jewish schools it was spoken of things, not of persons which is here also to be observed in the articles, what and whatsoever, one might produce thousands of examples out of their writings. So what I'm going to do is, at the end of the video, I'm going to take a maybe a screenshot, and maybe I'll just send a link to the Google Books so people can actually look this up. All the references are there where he gives just a dozen or so references to where the rabbis are binding and loosening. So what does this mean for us? This means that Yeshua was working within a common ancestry of rabbinic Judaism, that he was working within that matrix and where the rabbis pick up the mantle from the traditional Pharisaic system, Yeshua is saying, look, yes, this is a legitimate system by which I want to move with through, but I'm going to do a change in the tracks. The ones that are to be the true inheritors are the ones who are to be in my fold, the ones who are listening to what I'm saying and saying yes to what I'm going and see. I don't believe that Yeshua just saw the Pharisaic movement as one big group, but that Yeshua saw the Pharisaic movement really divide into two. And I've heard rabbis and things talk about 14 different sects of Pharisees. And, and that's not really the point here. The point is that Yeshua, when he was looking at the Pharisaic movement, saw two different types of Pharisees. He saw the Pharisees that bowed to him, and then he saw the Pharisees that didn't. And I want to show that there is the progressive revelation in Scripture that if one does not participate and upkeep with the progressive revelation of what God is doing, they miss God's actions in the world. And when they miss God's actions in the world, they forfeit their continuation in the promises and in the keeping of God. And I'm going to show that to you in this next verse. Luke 7. Might be a little bit small, but let's, let's try to get through this and I'll read it. Uh, John's disciples, and they go up to Yeshua and they start asking him about John. And then he, Yeshua answers, what did you go out in the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? But what did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? Those who are splendidly clothed and live in luxury are found in royal palaces. But what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I say to you, and one who is more than a prophet. He's obviously speaking about John, right? Yochanan the Immerser. This is the one about whom it's written, Behold, I send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way before you. I say to you, among those born of women, there is no one greater than John, yet he who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. When all the people and the tax collectors heard this, they acknowledged God's justice, having been baptized with the baptism of John. But the Pharisees and the lawyers, the Torah teachers, rejected God's purpose for them, not having been immersed by John, not having been baptized by John. So that's a huge thing that God may have purposed the Pharisaic movement as a reform movement within the first century to call them back to Torah observance, right? Because it couldn't have been the Sadducees. The Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection. They only believed in certain aspects. They didn't believe in, in the resurrection of the dead. There were many things that the Pharisees didn't partake of, but the Pharisaic movement was the one that was most aligned biblically. And yet God's purpose for the Pharisaic movement was to be about God's business. But yet some within the Pharisaic movement did not walk in the ways that God had called them to walk in. Thereby, when they rejected the immersion of John, by rejecting what, what John had been done and proclaiming the coming of the Messiah, they moved themselves out of God's purpose and plans. Look at that one more time. Since they did not receive the immersion of John, They have rejected God's purpose for themselves. 
that indeed God may have had a purpose for the Pharisaic movement. Listen, the modern church expression of these local communities of meeting that is not centered on the temple is based upon the innovations of the Pharisees. So there's much that we owe to the Pharisaic expression. But does that mean that whatever the Pharisees said in that time period is still binding to today? No, it's not because those who did not take the immersion of Yochanan have forfeited God's purpose and plan for their life. And indeed, those who not who do not profess Messiah Yeshua as Lord of their life have forfeited God's purpose for their life because God is continually moving. Same thing happened in the days of Noah. Those who didn't believe that Noah was a man of righteousness, a preacher of righteousness, they did not receive the redemption and the entering into the next life. So they weren't saved from the floods of the waters. So it's a huge thing. So who sits in the seat of Moses? I would say that it is the Messianic rabbis and the Messianic teachers and the leaders who sit in the seat of Moses. Therefore, when we look at the whole expression that becomes the 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 Jewish tradition, the, the rabbinic expression, it's not it's not an expression that allows us to pick up and put down different things. It is an enclosed system. And I believe that the necessity of what we need is to recognize Yeshua as the fulfillment of what is that Pharisaic expression because Yeshua would have aligned himself more closely with the Pharisaic expression, with the Pharisaic norms. He would not have been aligned with the Sadducees or the Zealots or other groups. He would have been aligned with the ideals of the Pharisees and the disagreements that he had with them would have been in-house disagreements. So when we're looking at the, at, at the, the, the adoption of of Jewish tradition. We need to understand that Jewish tradition can't be lorded over us or we can't be felt to force ourselves into certain practices that may not be biblical. We need to recognize the supremacy of the Messiah in establishing the authority of his disciples and walking in the power of the Spirit after that to do what God leads us to do in our communities. We're going to look at this next verse, which is Galatians 3. And it says, and this is in relation to the supremacy of the Messiah, that the law of the Torah has become our tutor to lead us to Messiah so that we may be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. That there is, there is, and there's much to be said about that verse, but the supremacy of the Messiah, the, the grandness and the bigness of what the Messiah is, is what we need to be looking towards and understanding for how we live our lives. And the reality is that any Jewish tradition that we pick up, whether it's how we tie our tzitziot, whether it's wearing a yarmulke or a talit or having Torah services or having synagogues or anything that we need to do, we need to align it with the revelation of all of God's word, looking at through the lens of the Brich HaDashah and understanding um, the supremacy of the Messiah of Israel in being the Baal HaTorah, the master of the Torah. Good stuff. So let's look at another verse, 2 John 7 to 11. It says, For many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not acknowledge Messiah Yeshua as coming in the flesh. This is the deceiver and the Antichrist. Watch yourselves that you do not lose what we have accomplished, but that you may receive a full reward. Anyone who goes too far and does not abide in the teaching of Christ, the teaching of Messiah, does not have God. The one who abides in the teaching, he has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your houses and do not give him a greeting. For the one who gives him a greeting participates in his evil deeds. And really, the teaching of Christ, the Daskalos, is really what we understand to be the Torah of Messiah, the Torah Mashiach. That, that the, the supremacy of the Torah of the Messiah is the way that we need to really view the world and view how we walk our Messianic Jewish expression. Right? That, that a Judaism without Yeshua is, not, is a Judaism that is not worth much because Yeshua brings fullness and greatness and amazingness to what is the traditional Jewish religious expression. That 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 Yeshua is the true lifeblood of the Torah, and that without Him, there really is no wholeness and no completeness. And and I think looking at this one more time, it's a heavy word to give, and and and, and many people don't like this because it doesn't jive with their conceptions of God or the conceptions of what of what they think God should do or could do or would do or their understanding of the Hebrew Bible, the Tanakh, what was typically called the Old Testament. People think that their understanding of it doesn't jive with this. But the reality is that if you are not abiding in the Torah of Mashiach, the Torah of the Messiah, the law of the Messiah, the teaching of the Messiah, then you can't be in him. Then you don't have 
have the Father or the Son, that you are cut off from God, that that if you if you lift up any any teaching or thought or concept or or law or chuchat or mishpat or any ruling, any halachic ruling that is not a ruling that is rooted in the Messiah of Israel and with his understanding and with his grace and mercy and by the power of the Spirit, then you have one that stand, could stand very much in opposition to him. And most of the time, it is in opposition to him. So the reality is that the truth of what our expressions look like in the Messianic movement, you know, you might have some synagogues that are doing Torah services every Shabbat and, and that are bringing out the Torah and they're reading from it and they're chanting to it and they're doing the traditional tropes and they're doing the traditional blessings and the Baruchot and the blessings. And then you're going to have some that don't. And the reality is that there needs to be a, a leading of the Spirit of God, that there needs to be a leading of the Ruach HaKodesh. And the, and, and the reality that with the gospel going out to many nations, we're going to have multicolored, multi-ethnic, multi um, styles of worship that are being brought into the Messianic movement that indeed what is a Messianic Jewish movement will have the nations with them and the nations will bring the wonderful things that that that, that are, make them amazing and make them beautiful. Their culture, their language, their songs, their styles, their dances. And that and then God desires to create this ta- this amazing tapestry of the one new man. And and this one new man is something that is going to radiate. And, and it's really about the tikkun olam because in the Garden of Eden, there was no Jew or Gentile. There was Ben Adam. There was Adam. There was human beings. There were sons of men. They were, they, that is what was initially in the Garden. And this is the place that God is desiring to take us back to. Not that there's a, 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 an erasure or, or a disappearance of the distinction between Jews and Gentiles and, and New Covenant believers. But that that does not become a hindrance, but rather a, a, a greater ability to have closeness. That our differences, being Jew and Gentile, complement one another, and they elevate and bring glory to the name of the God of Israel. Just the same way that me and my wife are not the same thing. I'm a man; she's a woman. But our differences complement one another, and together we can bring glory to the name of the God of Israel. And this is the reality. Going to John 14, 6, it says that the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name. This is Yeshua speaking. He will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. I don't think that we can truly create a biblical, holy, correct, Yeshua honoring, messianic Judaism without the power of the Holy Spirit. And I, and I firmly believe that, that if one is not walking with the leading and with sensitivities to how the spirit is leading, they will be distracted. They will be destroyed. They will focus on things that are not the most important things. And we need to be focused on what is the expression that God has for our community. Because the reality is that Israel being a light to the nation requires requires a movement of the spirit. It is only by the power of the spirit that we can be a light to many nations. See, the rabbis, the traditional rabbis, they want to claim an authority for themselves that the, that the Tanakh just does not give them, which is an authority to bind people to their traditions and their messer world. Well, and while I believe that many of the traditions within Israel, that I, I walk within them and I, and I do them and I practice them and I live them, but I live them by the power of the Spirit. And I know that the traditions that we walk in are not things that God judges us by. He judges us by his written word. And and this is something that I believe that has been missed in the traditional rabbinic world, where although there is an understanding of the difference of what is the Rabbanan and what is actually written in the Torah, and that some say that they, they ascribe different levels of weight, some within the rabbinic movement, say that they ascribe different levels of weight to different laws that come from the Talmud or rabbinic literature versus what comes from the written Torah. But the reality is that if they don't, that many in the traditional Orthodox world see them as both the same. And, and the part two to this is actually going to go into the writings of the rabbis where they say that they are the same. But it is true, brothers and sisters, that the God of Israel is judging his people based upon the written word. Exodus thirty four twenty seven says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Write down these words, for in accordance with these words, I have made a covenant with you and with Israel." 
בימי אדוני אל משה כתב לך את הדברים האלה כי על פי הדברים האלה קראתי איתך ברית ואת ישראל. That there is what God has written down is what we need to be looking forward to. Will there be traditions that raise up within Yisrael? Of course, Yeshua wore his tzitziot the way the rest of the Pharisees and the rest of the Jews of those days wore their tzitziot. Did Yeshua go to the synagogue? Yes, Yeshua went to the synagogue, which is a Pharisaic invention. Did he read from the Sefer Torah the way the rest of the Jewish people would have read from a Sefer Torah, a Torah scroll? Absolutely. And we can do the same thing because the Jewish heritage and tradition of what has been normative within Israel is the right of the Messianic Jewish believer. To move within and to allow the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit of God, to allow us to pick up and put down. And we can do that without saying sorry, without feeling bad, without backstepping. That Yeshua indeed give, gave his disciples the right to make halachic rulings, uh, rulings based upon how we should live in our communities and walk in them. He said that whatever you bind will be bound, whatever you loose will be loosened. And the reality is that the Messianic movement needs to grow in this place and, and, and no longer look at what does the church think of me? What does the synagogue think of me? But we need to understand that what does Yeshua think of us? Who are we called to be? And it's a very real matter of conviction by the leading of the Ruach, how deeply we're going to walk in some of these things. Some synagogues, Messianic congregations are not going to use Siddur. Some are going to do more liturgy. Some are going to do less. All the men might wear Sitziot. All the men might not. Sitziot being the fringes that are worn on the corners of the garments. Maybe your Messianic congregation, your rabbi is going to make a halakhic ruling that yarmulkes and kippot head coverings are worn on the bima, the way traditional synagogues do it. Maybe your congregation might say, no, we feel that it's more tradition. It's a masora. It's a custom. It's a minhag to wear it on the bima. You can, but you don't have to, that we're not requiring it. Why can't we be confident in allowing this? If we make the decision, hey, look, Jewish tradition teaches that you can't eat meat and milk together. But in our Messianic community, we've decided that this is more of a minhag. This is a custom that we're going to allow our members to eat meat and milk together. See, we need to recognize that we can have this authority and yet have these differences where there are customs and traditions within Israel, customs and traditions within the Jewish people and within rabbinic literature and rabbinic traditions. But we don't, but we need to understand that what is not a tradition, what is not a minhag, what is not a custom, what is what is not a masora is the Torah that we receive from the God of Israel. And this is what God is going to judge his people by based upon his whole word from Genesis to Revelation. This is how we know what sin is not based upon the traditions of the rabbis, whom I do highly respect, and I do respect the literature, I love the literature, but there is a, a hierarchy of authority in the life of the believer, and the primary hierarchy is the, the written Torah, and nothing comes close to it. Therefore, no man can bind another man down with sin based upon traditions of Messorahs. Simply as that. First Thessalonians 5, 12 says, But we request of you, brethren, that you appreciate those who diligently labor among you and have charge over you in the Lord and give you instruction, and that you've seen them very highly in love because of their work. Live in peace with one another. So the question is, when does a halacha in a Messianic community become sin? See, I think that Messianic leaders and congregations and teachers and even in churches, when pastors establish rules for their community of the way that things should be done, and they break that, it indeed could be sin. I'll give you an example. If your Messianic congregation said that, hey, look, we are not going to wear yarmulkes on the bima. We're not going to wear head coverings on the bima because this is the leading of the Spirit of God that in our community that we feel like we should not. Or vice versa. They say, hey, look, I feel that we should always wear yarmulkes, keep both on the bima, on the, uh, the front of the congregation, the lifted place every Shabbat. And if you decide that, look, I'm not going to wear it up there, or I am going to wear it in opposition to the leading of the leadership who you feel that God called you there to follow, then you can be in rebellion to the leader. See, we need to understand that when God establishes leaders and, and, and teachers and communities, that he establishes them to lead the community in righteousness and in right living. And that if you believe that God established that leader, you should be willing to follow 
the leading of the leader in these gray areas as they establish a lock of authority, understanding that Yeshua did give his disciples the authority to make rulings in their communities and their congregations. So indeed, that could be sin, but it's not sin because of the yarmulke or the kippah or because of the ruling of the leader themselves, but it's because you are going against something that has been established in the community. Right. It's not that one leader can say, look, this messianic congregation down the street, you're in sin because you're not wearing yarmulkes on the bima. But we can say in our community, we wear yarmulkes or kippot on the bima, even though in my community, we don't require head coverings on the bima, but we do require talits on the bimas. So we've created a halakhic ruling for what we do. Yet, if someone decides, you know what, forget about those guys, I'm going to go up there without a talit or I'm going to go up there opposite of whatever they say, then the person is breaking the following of the leader. Hebrews 13, 17 says, Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with grief, for this would be unprofitable for you. Another example, Dome Sukkot, we use ethrogs for the pleasing fruit to shake before the Lord. Does it mean that somebody on the other side of the world is dishonoring the Lord because they shook an orange in their sukkah? Absolutely not. See, for our community, it would be a sin against the leadership if someone brought an orange to shake during Sukkot. But if someone is doing it on the other side of the planet and they don't have any convictions to follow the traditions of Israel, then they're not sinning because they brought a fruit that is pleasing to the eyes, even though it is not part of Jewish tradition, because the rabbis are not the final authority in Messianic Jewish expression. But this does not mean that we give up every single right to participate within the traditions of Israel, because as Messianic Jews, the traditions of Israel are our right and our heritage as well. The same way that when Yeshua Messiah took on flesh, his heritage was the heritage of what was going on in Israel at that time. But he did not feel bound to every single ruling that the traditional Pharisaic system came up with. So each community is to decide for themselves how to live and the teaching by which they should go under. That each person should be led by the Ruach. But this doesn't mean that we can create halakhic rulings against moral commands that are given in the Torah. This does not mean that we can create halakhic rulings where the scripture is black and white, that this is absolute sin. But it does mean that we can move by the power of the Spirit, that we are empowered by God to make rulings for our local communities and how we express ourselves in walking out God's Word. But the reality is that there, there is a true Torah, there is a true understanding and teaching, just the same way we are walking in Torah Mashiach, the, the law of Messiah, the Torah of Messiah, that this is what the Lord calls us to. But indeed, there is a there is another teaching. There is a strange teaching. There are, there are strange Torahs that are being proclaimed. They're being proclaimed on the internet. Things that are awkward and that bog men down. Hebrews 13, 9. Don't be carried away by varied and strange teachings. For it is good for the heart to be strengthened by grace, not by foods, through which those who were so occupied were not benefited. And when it talks about the strange teaching, it is a, it is a Torot Shanot Vezerot, that it is a, it is a strange Torah, that it is another Torah, one that does not find itself rooted in the God of Israel. And there'll be another teaching more on the different types of Torahs that we see in Scripture. See, there is one Torah, one law of God, but the way that it manifests itself to different people in different time periods, in different situations and circumstances. Is something that needs to be expressed and explained. Remember that a man is not bound to the laws of Nadab, which is menstrual and menstrual purity or impurity. The same way that if you're not a Kohen, you're not bound to the laws of priesthood. If you're not a high priest, then you're not bound to the laws of the high priest. So there is a sense where the Torah is applicable to different people at different time periods based upon different situations of where God is at in the history of the redemption of mankind. 1 Timothy 1.3 says, As I urged you upon my departure from Macedonia, remain on at Ephesus. And this is Rav Shaul, Paul, the Shaliach, the apostle, speaking to Timothy, his son in the faith. He says, remain at Ephesus, 
so that you may instruct certain men not to teach strange doctrines. And these strange doctrines are what? The Torah, a cheret, that they are another Torah, a Torah after, uh, uh, something that has come afterwards that is contrary to what he has passed down to his son in the faith. So the reality is that we need to be aware that there are many, many strange Torahs. And some of the strange Torahs that are out there are plain, and some of them are, are, are hidden within some truth and 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 the best the best type of lies are the ones that have a little bit of truth and a little bit of a, a little bit of lie inside of it and these are these strange torahs these torahs that 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 might appear to be true they seem to have a an air of authenticity to it but the reality is that when you when you try to apply the torah that is being handed to you by people and by teachers you can't really practically live it out you can't practically do the things that are within it so may we be be a people that are and and people in the church world, people in the in the messianic synagogue world, and two in the traditional synagogues and all over the world, atheist secular people. May we come to the teaching of the Messiah of Israel, which is the culmination of all things. And when we come to Him and learn His Torah, learn His teachings, learn His law, it's not a heavy burden for us. It's not something that bogs us down, but indeed it makes men free. And we don't do it just in our own power and our own strength, but we do it in the power of the Spirit. And this is the reality because traditional rabbinic Judaism wants to give us another Torah. It wants us to give us the, it wants to give us the Torah Shabbat, hey, which binds us up on the rulings and and judgments and and that are based upon the Talmudic writings, and the rabbinic literature and the Mishnah. And the reality is that these things, many of these things, stand in in opposition to the Messiah of Israel, and we need to rely solely on His Torah, His truth, His words, His reality. And if we do that. We'd be blessed in our walk. We'd be more fruitful for the kingdom of God. And we'd be majoring on the majors and not minoring on the minors. So with that, I'm going to let you go. Don't forget, if you do like this video, like, subscribe, check me on YouTube, ring that bell, get the notifications. God bless you in the name of the Messiah of Israel. Peace out.